is a somatic scribe. I've been in the world of facilitation for almost 15 years, I think, and uh, oftentimes we're lucky enough to work with what used to be, or what some people still call a graphic recorder, a, a way to capture what is happening in the room through images. Uh, Kate Morales and people in their space are redefining the craft of that used to be called graphic recording into something that Kate and their cohort referred to as somatic, being a somatic scribe. So you're scribing, but you're also moving, moving what is happening and somatizing it, what is happening in the room and somatizing it through your body as you capture it in art. I've been blessed to work with Kate a couple of times while I've been facilitating and Kate has been scribing and it's been such a powerful combination that I just had to interview them because this this person and um, Kate is uh, uh, younger than me, um, which also I also find important to have more conversations across generations, um, has such an embodied wisdom um, and has a way of living their way into their values um, that it is a manifest in this beautiful, beautiful way to capture what has actually happened um, in a room through art. And so Kate reminds us, even in this episode, that before any of us could write, we, we were pictorial. We, we, we would draw um, in a ceremonial way what was transpiring, right, in, in our rituals and, our, and, our, and in our comings together and the wisdom that was to be remembered um, and that was moving through a space with its aliveness. So the world, the, the role of the world of the scribe wasn't just to um, copy what was said. It was to, to, to understand it with their bodies. They were trusted with that skill. And uh, this is, this is a very, very cool, um, deep episode. Um, where we talk about ancestral wisdoms, about what it means to be in our bodies, about scale, about art, about the state of movements. I learned so much. I, there was a couple of things that I that I that I am taking home I'm very, very personally, particularly a certain perspective on on rest that I'm that I'm literally learning to sit with. Um, and so I hope you've got a, you get as much as a, out of it as I did. I think Kate is a phenomenal human being. Um, and I th think you're going to love this podcast, uh, this episode. My name, if you don't know me, is uh, Gibran Rivera. I, um, I often serve as a guide, definitely a coach. I'm a facilitator. Um, and I'm a teacher. And with this podcast, I am inviting you into an ongoing unfolding decentralized conversation meaning you all get to be a part of the conversation you if there's something here that resonates with you you get to share it you get to speak with others about it and we keep nurturing a field in conversation with these remarkable humans who are devoting their life to the evolution of consciousness and culture your attention is invaluable i am so honored by you giving some of it to us and i hope that this nourishes you and it helps you do what you are here to do. Enjoy and let me know what you think. Kate Morales, what a pleasure and privilege to be with you on this podcast episode today. It's been a little bit of a long time in the making, but but we are here. We get to talk. How are you doing today? <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, the honor is mine. Really happy to be sitting with yeah. you today. Yeah, well, I'm excited for our listeners to get to know you and I'll share a little bit about what I know um, and also share some about my intent. But you and I have met in an unusual but cool sort of collaboration where I've been facilitating uh, retreats both virtual and in person and you have been capturing what is unfolding with art and uh i've just been really 
impressed by your work. And I think it merits saying we've met and done work together through the work of the Center for Cultural Power, which is I th- one of the leaders, if not the leader, in, in supporting culture makers in movement spaces and BIPOC people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a quite an honor to to be invited there and then to get to partner there. And I know that uh, Tara, the, the the person that helps run the center, has been very keen on getting you and I together. So I want to I want to give her a shout out. <laughs> and she's very pleased by uh, by uh, being a doula to our connection. So I definitely want to <laughs> shout her out because she's definitely onto something. Because not only are you capturing what is unfolding uh, with beautiful art, it's it's to me the metaphors that you use when you help us understand what the images are, the textures that you use, uh, the reliance that you have on an understanding of the elements, a relationship to the earth. And also, um, you often help actually hold the space with some embodied practice. So I know that that's a big part of your life. Um, that's a, I know I've, I'm saying a lot. Maybe the last thing I'll say before I invite you to tell us something about how you'd like to introduce yourself is I find it really important to talk across uh, generational lines. Um, I think there's so much there. I think there's so much room for for misunderstanding and for tension and for resentments. And that's kind of like the habit of generations, <laughs> intergenerational uh, relationships. And uh, I certainly have fallen prey to that, to be completely transparent. And so it is really also that is one of the reasons why, why I want to make sure uh, we talk so that I can keep learning from what younger people are bringing. <laughs> But uh, tell us tell us something about how you introduce yourself, and we'll certainly get more into your story. Um, but yeah, tell us something about you. Thank you. Well, such an honor to be in conversation with you. I echo the um, gratitude for Center for Cultural Power and all of the brilliance mm-hmm. that they bring and how they've brought us together. I have a really fun job to try to make into an elevator pitch. It's <laughs> it's usually something that folks haven't heard of. Some, if if anything, people have heard of graphic recording or graphic facilitation. And the word that I really like to orbit around is scribe. And like you mentioned, I can't do my work, make translating text into visual without moving it through my body. So. I call myself a somatic scribe because it requires meaning making requires the 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 ideas into the speech into the body into the marker onto the page back to the viewer making meaning and it's this whole dance of meaning making that involves our minds and our hearts our bodies and our collective field and so that's that's why I gravitate around the words semantics and, and Ooh, a scribe. You, I am uh, literally like one step away from jumping up and down. I wasn't ready to to start here, Kate. I'm really <laughs> and truly so. I'm gonna geek out for a second here with you, and then get to a question. Let's um, do it. So I've been doing a lot of work trying to learn and understand, and even you know, hoping to better translate the work of a great public intellectual called John Verveke. And uh, I think one of the most foremost thinkers right now in the Western cultural tradition. And um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to get to what you do through this. So he talks about different kinds of knowing with propositional being this way in which, where we like holding, I like arguments, right? Like um, it, it could be anything, but in our space, it could be, ideological arguments right like you propose this and i propose that and it says we are stuck culturally at the level of propositional knowledge and understanding and meaning making mm-hmm. and and so then he says from procedural interconnected are from from propositional you have procedural which is like how to actually do something like how to do something more technical there's something procedural to the way in which you make art that's not what you described you do right but there's something basic right that that is not basic at all actually but fundamental where you have to 
know how to you do something I don't know how to do before you even get into what you talked about. Then he talked about perspectival. And perspectival is like the perspectives that you take. So right now you and I are talking and um, what is foregrounded is kind of this the, this relationship between us, the podcast context, and the screen, right? And we talked a little bit about like the front lines in which you've been lately, right? And when you're there, something else is foregrounded and something else is backgrounded, right? And so this kind of perspectival knowing mm-hmm. and finally what he calls uh, participatory knowing, participatory knowing, which is which is kind of where ritual comes from, which is like the, where you move in the world and the world moves as you move through it, right? And so there's a, this dance between agent and arena. And so when a child puts on a mask and a cape, they're not just playing, but it's a kind of serious play whereby they are embodying an archetypal, right? And so I only go on this riff because that's what like sparked up for me really strongly when you were speaking about what you do, right? There's a way in which you are literally alchemizing and somatizing something. There's there, there's a, what I felt and sensed was that you are there is something ritualistic to the way in which you're relating to the energy and what is unfolding in the room and you knowing it in a participatory way, right? And so what you are expressing, right? It's, it's not just a, pro, a, a translation of a, of a proposition or an idea. It's something that, that moved through you. That's just all of what I heard in what you said. And I, I it gave so much more meaning to what I see you do. <laughs> yes, so much yes. And Yivran, I'm so excited to talk about ritual with you today. I have a lot of questions yeah. for you too about this. And I that's that's a great I've never used yeah. that framework, but it really the the heart of what I do is around cosmology mm-hmm. and my my inroad to understanding knowledge production, knowledge creation through visual arts comes from and out of my own explorations of returning to some of my own ancestry, mm-hmm. um, learning uh, learning Nawa and discovering that there was a role for the person who listened inside of the ritual and translated was the record keeper, right? The Tlaquilo. The Tlaquilo was was a, was the record keeper, and would listen with the with the priests, study with with the the knowledge makers of the community, translate them into pictorial and ideographic writing writing, and then that always was presented to people inside mm-hmm. of a ritual, and it was performed. People weren't going to libraries to consult right. the text. They were interpreted and all of the meaning was made together in community. So for me, it's really important to ground my work beyond the sort of birthplace of quote unquote graphic recording in the 80s to say, no, 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 my ancestors have been doing this for millennia. And I can, if I can situate the knowledge that we're making together outside of a Western cosmology as best as I can, right? I, you, I can't, I can't completely pull myself out of the, the, the logics that sort of run the world. But if we can like find a little crack and if we can start uh, making meaning together, I mean, I think that it really, you get a different outcome when you sit down at a table and the table cuts you off from your lower body and we're just heads and we're talking and then that talking gets translated into English, you will get different solutions for the problems that we are facing than when we sit together in a circle and we dialogue back and forth between text, image, body, you know, sensing in the social field, being conscious that we're in a ritual. And I think that a lot of us, I hear a lot of us asking these questions of how can we be imagining and designing a future that doesn't replicate the problems of the present. And to me, we have to, we have to 
we have to find a new cosmology to be playing inside of to get different um, yes. outcomes. Yes, like you could not, you could not get a more, a more clear and resounding yes from me right now. And what I'm appreciating very specially about what you're saying is not only the truth of it, is that you, that you're speaking from a practice. Right, I think what we what the, what we can fall into is speaking propositionally about the need to change the propositional, <laughs> right? So we can stand right, in the right. tables <laughs> with our, from our chest up, right, and uh, and talk about how we need to change how we do it. Um, but but you're coming from from you know in in a in a it's it's interesting, and, and we'll get to the more frontline work that you're doing. Because that's a kind of putting your body on the line in one way, but it should not be in any way misunderstood that that, that you are bringing your literal physical somat, somat self into the space of the work that you're doing when you're scribing, right? That there's there's a way in which your beingness has to be on the line, right? So that there can be any kind of true interbeing in the space. I feel, which is I think the edge we got to yeah. get to. This, it's totally the edge. I'm so glad you named that. It's really something that excites me. And as I'm teaching somatic scribing to other people, we, we kind of get to this edge of understanding that if we're moving with the energy in the room and the energy of the room we're we're digesting, we're transmuting, we're listening. the The role of the scribe is isn't necessarily like direct translation. It's also channeling. And I was never taught <laughs> by anyone how to channel. And sometimes you get into rooms with some real wacky energy yeah. that I don't necessarily right. want to be moving through my body or that I don't have the capacity to move through my body. And so there's there's really a, a learning edge for me around what are the other competencies that we need as scribes uh, that that might have come out of different traditions in the past. They might have come out of shamanic yes. traditions where someone was really expertly trained up to be able to, you know, when the, I'll, I'll use the language of, of spirit, when the spirit of white supremacy mm -hmm. enters the room as someone makes an, a microaggression or, um, you know, everybody can feel when that mm -hmm. moment like drops mm -hmm. and then the whole energy shifts as the scribe I'm asking myself, okay, I have to acknowledge this yes. spirit without feeding yes. this sure. spirit necessarily. And can I, uh, can I use my role to do the digestion so that what gets put on the page is useful and not replicating more harm. And that's another piece where um, my dear, dear friend, Sonali Balaji um, talks about social naturopathy mm -hmm. and scribes as, so as social naturopaths. So if what, so if what we, and this is another reason why we pull in the body, right? Because we live in these sort of nested mm -hmm systems. We've got our, our body's system. We've got a cultural system that is also shaped kind of like a body, um, which we understand through the metaphors right. that we use, right. right? We have like, we have like the head of the organization. Yeah. Like we literally have them at, we use these body metaphors to talk about the, yeah. the social and cultural systems we're in. And so there's a way that we can also look at the, the drawings as, um, maps of the body. We can look at them and use them diagnostically. Mm -hmm. We can look at them and see what's unwell mm -hmm. in the body. And then the, the, the training, the naturopathic training that can come in is how to accurately assess how to make adjustments to, to support more wellness in that wow. social body. Wow. So learning edges. Yeah, all. but that is some, 
That is beautiful, though. That is, it is. I can sense the edge of it, but I can also sense the the level of care um, already put into, you know, like trying to be there with it. It's 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 powerful because it might have been just last night, maybe the night before, I was talking with Tuesday. My I always to clarify Tuesdays that my beloved is her name. It's not it's not the day of the <laughs> week. Um, and uh, we were talking about you know I'm, I'm I practice in healing modalities and I think I know I've been gifted. Uh, like a, a lot of a lot of capacity meaning i can i can i can handle a lot of energy you know and um and it's i think it has everything to do with the clearness of my boundaries right um mm. but maybe because i can it might i might slack on the clearing that needs to happen after the ceremony you know um mm. the actual ongoing ritual for me as the holder of the space uh, that needs something to needs my own personal rituals for me to to stay clear and unburdened and and it's not that i'm very that i feel particularly burdened during the ceremony you know i i don't but you are moving a lot of energy through and in some cases when deep deep, deep healing is taking place you're witnessing some of the darkest aspects the hardest aspects of the human experience you know and um and there's no way not to there's no way one should not process that and i just kind of i'm just kind of feel how in some ways you are you are discerning uh what to work with life right there in this space and i think i have some familiarity with it as as well as some familiarity with the need to to stay healthy as we do this work, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wondering what you know what, what you know about that. What do you do to? Oh, I want to flip the question <laughs> okay. back to you because I have seen you work some magic <laughs> in in rooms, and it's it's apparent to me that you draw on your personal practices a lot, and that your experience from your own body is what allows you to support group and cultural bodies. And, and it was so refreshing <laughs> to get to be in a space with you. And I, uh, can yeah, I ask you course, a question back? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious about how you, how you reconcile. I just see it as bravery, but I'm sure there's something more under it around how you pull in the explicit language of, okay, everybody, we're in a ritual right now, when that sits next to professional culture and just, you know, also the, there's, there's not always, um, it's not always a comfortable place for people to meet with their colleagues. So I'm just so mm -hmm. curious about how you, you, you are so laden with <laughs> gifts of, of moving groups um energetically you have an intention to that energy and so i'm curious about how i think i'm seeing it more in our field and i'm and and i'm i know that i'm seeing it because yeah. we need it and i know that when people experience it they realize yeah. that they need it yeah. but f for you how do you how do you yeah, move that's beautiful across those mm -hmm. big cultural differences yeah, yeah. it's huge i mean look it's it's um let me see. Let me just kind of feel my way into the most helpful answer. Um, so one key, the most important thing, I think. Well, here's all the, I be, there's been a quote that has shaped my growth, which is the success of an intervention is directly proportional to the interior condition of the intervener. You know, so somehow I have. Come, I came to understand early on that somehow tending to my interior condition was going to make all of the difference, you know? And it's gonna come into an understanding that whatever I am cultivating in myself is is the, the thing itself um, has become mm -hmm. very powerful. Um, I think a commitment to grounding and anchoring a space and sort of, which can only be done by 
doing my best to be a grounded and anchoring person, right? An anchored person, right? So, totally. so just like simply like walking in with that awareness, you know, that walking into the space knowing that that like the strongest pendulum is going to help shape how the other pendulums move, right? And so meaning by the strongest, mm-hmm. I simply mean the most grounded in this particular case, because I think that's what we need. We need to like be on this earth. That's what we've forgotten. Um, and then over time, it really is integrity, trying to be in integrity with myself and like just speak the truth about what I'm doing and what I'm inviting us into and how I'm trying to meet what you've invited me to do with you, you know? And so over time, and look, let me be very clear. This is definitely a function of like the privilege of experience and reputation and time. But over time, I can be more and more selective with who I take on as a client um, because there has to be some understanding like what, you know, that, that you, that there's some welcoming of what I'm actually bringing because I can no longer hide it, you know, I can no longer hide it. Mm. Um, it doesn't work to hide it. And, and so, um, mm. yeah, so those are some answers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Thank you Beautiful. For asking. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. Is it okay to ask you kind of like kind of move us in a slightly different tack here? Let's do it. Okay. So I just want to, there's a question that I don't want to neglect to ask you, which is a question I ask everybody on the podcast earlier, earlier on, which is if you can share something that you once took to be true, something that was maybe identity defining, right? Um, That you no longer, either you no longer hold to be true or or at least you're holding more lightly now. Um, And and to Mm. to me, what I, I, the reason why I'm so committed to this question, Kate, is because I feel us hunkering and bunkering down into more and more rigidity, ideological rigidity that feeds only the polarization. And uh, and I'm like, when I interview or talk to remarkable humans, I want to be like, I want to show listeners how humans don't get to be remarkable without changing their minds about really big things <laughs> that, that, they, that they thought they were right about, you know? <laughs> and so I'm just curious if you have, if you have any, any of those for us here today. Thank you for this question. Oh my goodness. I'm just going to go first thought, best thought, which is my experience as a quote unquote mixed race person across the past decade and what I have believed about my racial identity and what spaces that has given me access and denial to. And it's something that, so like the shift towards using the acronym BIPOC, Mm -hmm. disaggregating um, Black and Indigenous people as having a different experience than other people of color inside of this country has made so much space Mm -hmm. for me to be a little bit more nuanced. And when I think about the, the, what we believe in right now, that is going to have to shift identity politics and particularly racial identity politics. Don't, I don't see, I don't see that road really carrying us to liberation and that's really scary. And it's, there's, there's not that much cultural safety even still to, to, to open that up. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any, I don't know where the road goes, but when I look at, um, what we're facing, everything that we're facing now from, you know, fossil fuels and wealth hoarding and, and 
the ways that we design our families based around reliance on capitalism and the ways that we understand ourselves through boxes that other people have imposed. And the, I don't see a future for any anything about of those of those ways that we've we've designed. And so it's helpful for me to to zoom out. And somatics has helped me do this in a way that, you know, when I when I look back and tune into my ancestors, remembering that there's 10,000 years of agrarian ancestors and 300,000 oh, sure. years of humans. Yes. And, and just like the smallness of this cultural moment where identity politics are um, are de defining so much how we can move together and how we can't mm -hmm. move together. And so I, I, as much as I feel the sort of carceral logic mm -hmm. of them, I also mm -hmm. feel the, the smallness yeah. of them. So, well, first of all, I want to, I want to honor you for the courage. I think of that I response. I think, I think you might, I think you're right that it's still unsafe to speak to this directly. And um, and I imagine, honestly, and maybe this is my projection and you can forgive me if it is or ask for forgiveness ahead of time, but I think it's even harder for you than for me, generationally and in the kind of space that you're living in and working in. Um, so I just really want to honor you for that. And I want to tell you I'm in full agreement with you on it and um, passionate agreement. Um, and that um, you probably read the piece that's been making the rounds by Maurice Mitchell, which is, I think, the, the only bad part about the piece, I think, is the title, which is Building Resilient Organizations, which is like, dude, you're talking about so much more than that here, you know? <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, like, you know he's, but he's starting a very, very, what came to me, I mentioned it in so many podcasts, I hope people pick it up. Um, what came to me as I heard you speak was well, so Maurice has done a beautiful job of articulating um, kind of intellectually, even, and he's got some some practice in there, but, and I think it's up, going to be up to people like you and me to uh, find ways to articulate that, that are more based on ritual, more based on scribing, more based on body. I think, I think, and I think he's inviting us into that too. You know, I, I don't think... I don't think Maurice is saying here it is. You know, here's the last the last word on this. Um, but it's a powerful articulation, and mm -hmm. I think more and more of us are saying it, and you saying it here with courage. I think, I think it's a it's a very hopeful thing. And I'm also want to name how moved I am by the distinction you make between three hundred thousand years and ten thousand years, and um, and uh, remind people that. When you've done something for three hundred thousand years, it's a part of you. You know, there's a great mm -hmm. little story of <clears throat> the young white man that went to Hawaii and spent some time there with Hawaiian natives and learned so much about themselves in the process. And then they were about to leave, and they say to the elder, "You know, at least you're close to your to to like your heritage. You know, we're so far removed." And he said to them, well, you know, surely you know how to light a fire. Surely hmm. you can figure out how to sing a song. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. you can remember that if you speak to a tree and you sit there long enough to listen, it will speak back to you. And mm. just the, you know, the simplicity of it too, of course there's plenty to learn, you know, but also it's right there. The moment, the moment we make room for it, is so cellular. It's such a part of our how we survived. Um, it's so pre-propositional, if you will, participatory, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. that, that it's right here, and I think that's really important for people to remember. You know. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Can I also ask you about your story? You know, uh, your background, how do you end up here doing this? Um, and where are you now? Because I know that's really important and I want to talk about that with you. Mm, thank you. 
Well, maybe today I'll start my story by saying that I have an artist mom who raised me proving to me that being an artist is a legitimate way of being Mm -hmm. in the world, both as a career and as a way of Mm -hmm. being. So shout out to my mom. Um, My early sort of influences that I can trace that kind of have have gotten me to where I am are just being a little nature kid, always outside, uh, deeply believing that I would never get a job and I would just grow my food and live on the land. As a young person, I really <laughs> look to them as my guiding star uh, as an adult. And I think that it, you know, my, my, my path has wandered me through quote unquote, education, schooling. I love uh, dipping into pedagogy and radical pedagogy and am my happiest when I'm in community with people who are reimagining education outside of colonial institutions. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that really informs my work when I finally was able to give myself the permission to make art uh, and, and devote my much of my time to that. I, um, that's, that's just a really fun intersection for me to play. And that's why I think that I've, I've centered in my work so much, the, the epistemological sort of like knowledge production piece of what we do when we, um, draw when we pull from the symbolic and from the metaphorical in how we communicate with one another. And to your point around having your own practices, your personal practices inform your work. I'm in a a non-nuclear intergenerational unschooling queer family that just brings me so much joy and is way more important than the client work that I do. So I would be remiss not to mention that most of my day I'm learning and unlearning with my nine-year-old and our, and a five-year-old and, and the, the creek behind the house and, and, and the, the milpa that we're growing. And so that's, that's an important part of my, (laughs) of my work. Thank you. Beautiful. I say, I say thank you. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for, for being here and for getting here. How long have you been in Atlanta and how long have you kind of been in the South? I moved here in 96. So to people in Atlanta, I'm not from Atlanta, but to everyone else, yeah, I'm I from understand. Atlanta. I completely understand. <laughs> I moved to Boston in 93 and it's 2023, you know, and I was 18. I was a boy. And, uh, but still the locals are, no, it's not. And then I know it, like my son was born, born here. So it's different. Uh, right. And so that's, a, that's, that's roots. That's home. Thank you for the gift of your attention. If there's something here that resonates for you, something that feels true and good, think about a friend that you could share it with. We curate for each other. And that's the only way the good stuff spreads. You were talking earlier before we started about the frontline conflict uh, that is there right now. And um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening for people that are not have not been keeping abreast of Cobb City and the death? the the efforts to protect the land. Yep. So Atlanta is a city inside of a forest. And apart from being the lungs of our city, it is the um, only reason why we don't completely melt in the heat. So the forest is such an important place, part of the ecology 
for us urban dwellers in this climate. There's the last sort of large remaining tract of forest is in the southeast. It's called the South River Forest or the Wilani Forest, as we've renamed it, according to the indigenous name for the river that runs mm-hmm. through. And there's a proposed $90 million <clears throat> police training facility that has been dubbed Cop City that would um, cut up to 300 acres of the forest and bring in more training, mostly through military tactics mm-hmm. for the Atlanta Police Department and would be a would be the largest training facility in the country. And it would attract lots of police from other parts of the country to Atlanta to get trained there, both to be in Atlanta and to go back and be policing in that way in other cities. So the um, resistance is very deep inside of Atlanta and it has larger implications for the entire country. And so uh, part of the strategy for uh, resisting it has been to bring in other people from around the country and, and, and put pressure on the, the mayor and um, the commissioners and, and just trying to, you know, we're trying at every angle, we're trying to find ways to um, prevent this disaster on, on this, you know, the, the, the environmental racism, the, um, the police violence, the, it's just the climate, the issues with climate, it's every single issue wrapped into one issue. Yes, it is. Yes, so. it is. And, um, and a really tough time for it because the kind of arc, you know, as, as often happens in, in this ridiculous media environment that we're in, uh, pendulums have are already turning, right? Are already shifting, and people like resistance to policing itself as a message in national politics is loose. Has lost incredible amounts of 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 strength, right? And so, even though you're talking about climate, even though you're talking about militarizing of police, even though it just lands in a in a media environment where things have shifted just three years, you know, right back to, to not only back to where they were, but definitely less willingness, even from our allies to, to listen and align. So I'm sure there's a, an additional level of challenge to what you're trying to do now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. The, the main newspaper the Atlanta Journal Constitution is owned by a person who sits on the board of the Atlanta Police oh, wow. Foundation. So right away, you just, you know what we're working with. <clears throat> wow. And on top of that, I think you're right. I think that lots of movement orgs and people who were in the big push across the uprising of 2020 <clears throat> have are are now in the like rest and recovery phase of how traumatic that was. And we're seeing instances of, of lots of people just going back to the ritual piece, kind of listening to our bodies and understanding that with a really big spike of response and activation, has to come a period of rest and recovery. And so it has been interesting to see the, the, the power in community, the people power kind of find itself through this issue. Mm -hmm. I think that the murder of our, um, our compañera Tortuguita Mm -hmm. really catalyzed a lot of, a lot more people mm-hmm. to the issue. And yeah, we were talking about Frontline's work. It's it's a ritual that really requires a high amount yeah. of skill is how I'm understanding it. Over, over the years of kind of being an organizer and stepping out and 
moving into nonprofit world and now being back in the streets and on the, on the land, it's very interesting to, uh, to look strategically at why it's, why it is strategic for us to be moving with ritual, moving with indigenous wisdom and medicine keepers and wisdom keepers, earth-based, you know, wisdom keepers yes. at the front. Because, you know, if what we're fighting against is the <clears throat> accumulation over generations of white supremacy and uh, incarceration, the logic of incarceration and um, disregard for Black life, Black and Indigenous life, if all of that has compounded to today valuing uh, at $90 million dollars the policing of our bodies, mm. <clears throat> the, the the like the strongest, most strategic intervention we have, if that's the core of what we're fighting, is that we stand with life, is that we stand believing that our interconnected web of life deeply uh, matters and deeply um, needs mm. one another. You know, that the, we need the trees, the trees yeah. need us, we need our neighbors. And so the people who know how to um, know how to do that energetically, um, I really, it's my personal uh, opinion that putting, putting our, putting our wisdom keepers and our, you know, our elders forward yeah. um, are, there it's it's just strategic yeah, it's to really be centering mm. centering those are those relatives let's say there's um i also i don't know how conscious you were as you did this but um i just want to honor our name um a move doesn't seem like the right word but a way in which you met my question because i in, I intervened at kind of a level of looking at the media and the political discourse and frames and you kind of you came back talking about movements being in a recovery period and contending with with what their bodies need after the traumatic experience of and it was just a, a lovely way to meet a question that is kind of framed at one level of consciousness and meeting it at a, at a deeper level or a different level and uh, that affirms an understanding of bodies and life and that then moved on to, to name how you see that happening in this movement itself with the putting of, you know, the, the centering on, of the medicine and the wisdom and the elder, the keepers of all of those things. Um, anyway, just uh, just saying, I noticed that and uh, appreciate, appreciating <laughs> it, appreciating it. it. There's something, Kate, um, in what you're bringing that feels very much to me. Um, it feels very thought through, but it, you're just just really truly living into um, your values. And that's that's not an easy thing to do, not in this. It never has been, and it seems extra hard in in these days under these economic conditions, you know. And uh, where do you got like? How does that happen? You know what I mean? How does that happen for you? Like, how do you how do you get here to this kind of commitment and this oh, like just returning to how am I going to embody and live this? Oh, I'm just spinning with this question because now I want to pick back up your piece around the media because narrative strategy yes, is yes, very yes, important yes, what yes, I do. Yes, yeah, man, but I feel like that's what you did. You're going to flip that on me, you know? Uh, well, let yeah. me... Go ahead. Take me wherever you want to go. Let, yeah. Let, let me back into the question this way. I, you know, we're speaking in, in a moment where where the majority of states in the U.S. right now are passing anti-trans legislation. 
right? This is a direct response from sort of uh, mainstream discourse driven by media to our sort of advocating for trans day of visibility, right? Trans day of remembrance. And so it's very interesting to me to see that more visibility is being met with more violence. And there is a way that I am very curious right now if, and I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the way you named that I twisted the question because I do think that, that the narrative is important and I do think that it is very worth our while to be uh, intervening into some of the, um, into the regurgitated sort of like police propaganda that gets just put out as fact, mm -hmm. you know, around this issue, for example. And I also am not convinced that more visibility will keep us mm -hmm. safe or will give us the outcomes that we think oh, we want. And so that's my way to back into your question of how to like, why, why the work happens in my, in the, in, I, why it's important to me to live my values mm -hmm. intimately and why to be, why I practice what I believe uh, inside of the sort of smallest levels of where our politics play out. So like my body, my family, inside of my home, those are places where I can really get a sense of, for example, we're abolitionists in our family. And so what that means is that we don't punish our kids. That means we find ways of working through conflicts together that are generative and restorative. And, um, and, and I know what that feels, I don't know what abolition feels like scaled up. And I think that that is why people sort of are responding back to um, our push for abolition in 2020 with more police because the, the vision, people don't have right. the vision yet. They can't right. feel it yet. And so I also can't see it played out at, across our entire systems, but I do know how to be abolitionist in my day-to-day -day life and in my interactions with my kid and, 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 you know, listening to the cop in my right. head and being like, okay, you're scared right, right now. Let's, you know, get you some water and a nap. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> oh <my> God, <laughs> this is what I've got. You needed to hear that. Jesus. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> you know, this wow. is, this is what I, this is what I have access to is, is, yes. is, you know, how I, and this is what cult, you know, cultural somatics also invites us to just be moving across these, these scales, mm -hmm. right? Because we're systems nested and systems nested and systems nested and systems, mm -hmm. you know, small reflects the all as Adrian Marie Brown reminds us. And so, yeah, I think that living our, our values intimately is, is um, how we, how we find the freedom we're looking for right now. And this is interesting. I'll just say this last point, <clears throat> you know, f even five years ago, this, the, if you looked across sectors at scribes making five-year plans and scribing for visioning retreats and things like that, you know, you, there was like the road, the right. sort of windy road, and then the horizon, and then the sunrise of the new so thing that's coming. And, you know, we thought about time in that way. And it's really interesting. I've been talking to other scribes about this. We are seeing more portals in our work and it it just is emerging in the in the cultural context right now and i think that we are i think that well my best guess is that pandemic experiences of time mm -hmm. have allowed us to understand that we can slip yeah. in and out of ways of being that help us that that like are touches of where we're going but they're happening yeah. right now and so that's another reason why I feel like it's so important for me to be um, spending a lot of time in my intimate life on purpose and with intention, because it it is a way that I get to kind of touch where we're going right now. That is so good.
that is incredibly wise and uh, I'm moved by it at a personal level. You know, it's just another reminder of a lot of what I'm learning in my own spiritual development. Um, I often speak of how so much of what we're moving away from are the vestiges of an industrial age and the 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 way of seeing the world through Newtonian physics, through you know the the the, the obsession, the the very patriarchal obsession with scale, you know, and uh, size, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, up, always oh, up, yeah, right? Up and big enough, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just like uh um, and so so many possibilities are not given a chance when they are showing themselves because we see them and we need to scale them. And since we can't see it at the beginning, then we don't, we don't kindle it in any way. We don't allow its light to show what's the most elegant next step because our kind of abstract visioning can't, can't see it all the way through. We shut it down before. Mm-hmm. It has any possibility, and I know that that to be a habit. And similarly, with possibilities for our own life, in terms of can we can we live from our art? You know, can we can we do what we're here to do? Well, that when the immediate prefabricated answer is no, and if you believe it, then the the, the part of you that is meant to be expressed is is it's kind of shut down to before it even has a chance, you know? And and then you get to 40 and you're a miserable human being because <laughs> because you have not, you know, you listen to somebody else's song instead of your own, you know? Uh, or that's yeah. not fair. It's not just your own, you know, but a deeper, a deeper, a deeper song, I think. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The, the connection I have to that is that I am in a really deep study right now around pattern mm-hmm. literacy. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tyson Yunkapurta in Sand Talk does so much beautiful articulation about pattern and being able to read the way that life organizes itself and how that in that uh, that felt sense of how life organizes itself kind of across the scales helps us recognize when we're in systems that are um, <laughs> sort of necropolitical that just don't, that have this sort of um, unnatural quality to them, an industrial quality to them, sort of, you know, they're organized around a logic that's not life affirming. And so I as we, you know, to link back to our, you know, 10, 300,000 year old ancestors who were deeply embedded in being able to read the, the literacy, their literacy was the patterns of branching, was the patterns of spirals, was the patterns of waveforms, yeah. right? And I, it's something that is a question for me as I'm working with groups to how, how I can also be supporting groups to be remembering their own pattern literacy, because all of our native written language is Mm -hmm. pictures. No one started out writing the alphabet. We started drawing pictures. That's our native written language. Correct. And so it's not, it's not a, it's an unlearning, not a <laughs> learning something new and a, and a remembering of what it is, how it feels to be inside of a system that is affirming life. And, you know, that also means that there's death inside of that system, but there's not stagnation, yeah. for example. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That is, that is. And that's, you know, that's quite, that's, that's the naturopathic case for things like abolition. That's the naturopathic case for um, climate justice Mm -hmm. is like, this is, this isn't, this isn't some really complex 
we have to heal and it's going to take us a really long mm -hmm. time and we have to change in order to be better. No, none, none right. of that. Like there's a, there's a way that life organizes itself. There's a song mm -hmm. that nature sings that we, if we, if we can quiet the sort of chaos, we can just find yep. the harmony right. to that, to that rhythm. And that's what, that's what health is. That's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to share a quick story that resonates with certainly everything you said, but especially that last bit. And uh, then I'm going to move us towards a couple of our closing questions. And I'll include some time for anything that you want to make sure um, we know about or hear from you. Um, but I just have this memory of years back, being in these three nights of ceremony and just being in close relationship with the the people that were, I don't know what you say, if you say heading or not heading doesn't seem right, but guiding us in ceremony, right? Like the, the, the healers and being in close relationship with them and, and just their experience, but also their humanity, um, their f foibles and fallibilities. And I remember coming out of a sweat lodge about like just the third night in the middle of the night, you know, it was arduous work and intense and, you know, the pipe was passed around and the wife of the medicine man said, you know, he dances with that pipe, you know, that's, that's how you get to pour the lodge. You got to, you got to sun dance and, and, I just burst into tears because in that moment of knowing them and being in real human relationship with them, it became so clear to me that we always imagine the ancestors as people that like knew all of these things that we have now forgotten. And some of that is still true, mm -hmm. but in the end, always it's been us trying to figure it out, trying to, to figure out how to be in this mystery and always trying to remember what your grandma said, you know, and how they did it, right? That's but right. there is something that is, there's never this this time where like everything was known. It's, it's a mystery, right? And we've always come to it mm -hmm. full of our, huma of our humanness, you know, with all of its need for healing. It's a life itself will break your heart. You know, sometimes I, I, I will bring an ikaro into a prayer. It was just a, it's a type of medicine song. And I like to pause and I remind the person like, this sounds ancient because heartbreaking is ancient. And so healing mm. is ancient, you know? It's like they, they go together. It's how we get to wisdom, you know? Um, so just affirming with big heart what, what you've just shared and wondering if it's okay mm. to, to, to move us in a, in, a, in a closing direction here. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. What a beautiful yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so, so important to remember. Yeah. It's just what you're saying too. Like we know, we know, we know, we know. Um, and we got to trust what we know, what our bodies know, like water and <laughs> naps this is i only like i was just so infected by that because i'm like wow what would happen if i drink i drink a lot of water but I, I could use a nap more frequently um, <laughs> um so there's a couple of questions i like to ask of the powerful people that i get to interview um one of them comes with a uh, an invitation that it will require some some consent. You can say, no, I don't want to time travel today. But the, the, the invitation would be to see if you can imagine yourself 20 years from now. And and if that's okay, then, then see that and you would have achieved certain things. And you will have failed at certain things. You have grown in some ways. And some parts of you that you're still working on, you'll still be working on. And, Life will have unfolded in mysterious ways and maybe a new generation would start to be born. And I'm less interested right now in you describing what that Kate looks like, but in you sharing with us what that Kate would say to you right now. You spoke about being 
informed by young Kate. Um, and I'm wondering what 20 years from now Kate has for you and for us. Hmm. Hmm. Well, in 20 years, inshallah, I will be 55. Mm -hmm. And if I can take any signs from my friends in their 50s, I I imagine that the advice will be orienting towards more mm -hmm. beauty. Mm -hmm. Orienting towards I think I mean 55 is like my kid will be 29. So I think about like the grandma the grandma protocols of how to hold space. Yes. Yeah. The ways that grandmas <clears throat> hold space. <throat> Just truth telling and being I hope I'm kinder. Yeah, I I hope that I'm kinder yeah. to myself and to and to you know the people that challenge me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the beings that challenge me. And I think that, well, there's a way that I feel myself shifting away from a quote unquote healing mm -hmm. journey as I'm finding that to be very chi intensive. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a lot of work to heal and I'm, I'm starting to find pockets of, of, being a little bit more receptive when when conditions in the dream change, right? If we're if we're in the dream and we're being dreamed and we're dreaming and you know and and conditions shift and maybe they create health outcomes. I mean, most certainly in 20 years they're creating health outcomes that are degenerating as well as uh as well as you know healing and transforming I, I i i aspire to be in 20 years moving with a lot more mm -hmm. options for how to respond when when conditions are shifting in the dream and that i can be a little bit less reactive and a little bit more playful i hope i'm a clown <laughs> i love it i love it i love it you know, you know this just this morning, I don't know that I, he went all the way to clown, but just this morning I was kind of rereading a, a Rumi poem and it was all about laughter, you know. It was all about mm -hmm. laughter and he talks about laughter in defeat. He's got this line where he comes, come, open me up and steal my peril. Yeah, and I and I will mm. still laugh, you know. And when I brood, <laughs> notice how I still laugh. And thunder is a way that laughs through the storm, you know. And it's just like there's something oh. so powerful to that. Ashe. Ashe. So yes. then the other question that I ask the powerful people that grace me with their time our listeners um, is, you know, I do a lot of work with, with men, especially cis men, and not exclusively heterosexual men, but off, most often. And, and uh, I just have a big commitment to help us work through the sins of patriarchy and to remember what a conscious masculinity looks like. And, um, and so I like to ask people such as yourself, you know, do you have any wisdom, any advice that I should bring back to the man's work? Anything that, well, the simple question is what should men do, you know, in this, in this time when like the old way needs to die, you know, but, but 
but so many of us we know what is not not all of us but you know more of us know what is toxic but we don't know what the what the opposite of that is and i'm just wondering if you have any offerings or any observations from your life experience mm. yeah thank you well i also talk to um a lot of men in in my lineage and in me i'm actually not that friends with that many <laughs> cis men um <laughs> But as a as a as a non-binary trans yeah. person, I do a lot of talking with my own That's masculinity, it. and the what has. I'm just going to be practical. Yes, that's like, what I need. <laughs> what, is, what has really yeah, worked yeah. <laughs> in talking to all the yeah. dudes who are causing all kinds of havoc in my body is to just mm. rest. Just like, just stop. Oof. Just like, here's a nest. Like, it, you know, I, I've I've built them a little nest, and I just I'm like, just go and lay down. Wow. <laughs> and um. And they they you know they show up the sort of like arch archetypal or my new favorite word is archigestural. <laughs> The sort of <clears throat> ways that archetypes move, right? Like how they how they posture yeah. themselves. There's 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 the sort of patriarchal logic of my mind that wants to be really patronizing to other parts of my body. He needs to go lay down. You know, even when I think that I'm being kind and being like, okay, you're hurting. I understand. It's like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. That's 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 not how we're doing this. We're we're moving from the intelligence of all of us in in the body. Wow. So you don't you don't get to be the one that's sort of like patronizingly be like, it's okay for you to feel this. Like the other parts of my body are like, girl, I know that yeah. already. Yeah. I know it's okay to feel my yeah. feelings. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so even when even when the sort of like masculine energies want to like show up in a kind way, like they still need to just like go be quiet wow. and and listen more. Gotcha. Oof. Thank you. I am deeply moved. But the whole thing I but but very personally with the rest part, which is the second time it comes up, right? The nap. And now this, there, there's something uh -huh. here. There's a way in which you're channeling something from my my personal soul, just like you know, <laughs> my own personal journey. And I'm receiving that with a warm and listening heart. Um, something mm. is, is not, it's not easy. It doesn't come easily to me. And uh, it seems sentimental. Well, I would... <laughs> I, you know, it may not come easy. And I also think that there's a lot stacked yeah. against us, right? There's, there's culture, yeah. everything in our culture and our economy is designed towards inflammation yeah. and hypervigilance. And so when we, when we stop enough, there, there's often a backlog yeah. of, of, um, <laughs> you know, rest that's got to happen. You are absolutely right. It's so beautiful. So, and just you know, lifting up, lifting up the um, the wisdom of our of our black feminist teachers like Trisha Hersey and all of the you know the I look to black feminism particularly because the way that our society has been designed around the extraction of black and feminized yeah. labor. So, and just really wanting to nod to to the black feminists as, as the teachers for, for, for how we rest and why we rest and who needs what kind of rest. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Just making myself a note. Um, well, Kate, is there anything, this has been medicine, magical, wonderful, and I knew it would be, but yeah, it has exceeded expectation. Uh, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. <laughs> really, I, I just, I cannot encourage you more. Like some, You're doing something right and it's perceptible. And so I really want really to thank you for it. And uh, I'm so glad that I get to help. Uh, not 
not to help that I that I get to introduce you to the listeners that that, that know you 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 or your work or your perspective. Yeah. Um, anything that we need to know about you? I mean, we'll get show notes, but anything that you want to say on the podcast about finding you, about ways to work with you, any words of wisdom that you want to leave us with before we close. Mm, thank you. This has been such a beautiful conversation. I'm so graced to get to share some of, or be receiving some of your wisdom as well. And I'll close by just inviting folks to to, to come learn with me. I really feel uh, joyful in my uh, studentship mm-hmm. of many of the things that we've discussed. And um, so, you know, I work with groups and organizations. I'm also teaching for people who sit at the intersection of facilitation, somatics, visual art, meaning making writing, where it's a it's a watery container of who finds us. But um, we will be uh, we have a couple of classes coming up, and then a lab in the Beautiful. fall. Is this all found in As the Crow Flies or somewhere else? Yeah, it's all okay. on my website. And is it dot As the Crow Flies? As the crow flies design as the crow flies com. design.com. Thank you yep. uh, so much. This has been a, a real blessing. I cannot wait to to release it and to see how it's received. But this has been real medicine, um, certainly for me. So I'm just very grateful. Gracias. Yeah. Thank you. Gracias. My heart That's is joyful. It. It. Signal versus noise. There's so much competing for our attention. And I am so glad that you stayed with us through the end of the podcast. It should mean that you're finding something meaningful here. Hopefully, something worth sharing. And so I'm asking again that you think of somebody who would be touched by this conversation, who wants to be a part of it some way. It is a decentralized conversation. It is a way in which we're changing ourselves by leaning in towards each other in places like this and in the exchange of these ideas. So who's a person or two that will be specially moved by what you've heard here today? Send them a text, an email. Let them know we're here. We are not trying to reach everybody. but We want to reach the right people. We want to keep having this decentralized conversation. We want to keep working on getting right to the edge of the evolution of consciousness and culture to see what we find here together. Thank you again for being a part of this. Liking the podcast helps. Subscribing is definitely a good thing. Feedback is always welcomed. Stay in touch.